Welcome to uh, this week's uh, Geometry Model Theory Seminar. Um, today's speaker is Afta Patel from uh, Western University uh, in London. And uh, he will tell us about equisingular algebraic approximation. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, the organizer, Professor Spicer. Uh, and uh, for everyone who's uh, here today. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, the equisingular algebraic approximation of real and complex analytic germs. Uh, this talk is based on work that I did for my PhD thesis at the University of Western Ontario under the supervision of Professor Janusz Adamus. And um, the results that I'll be presenting today uh, have been published in a paper in the Journal of Singularities in uh, 2020. That's uh, given here. So uh, to start off, uh, we will let uh, the letter K denote the field of real numbers or complex numbers. And uh, we will let X be a K analytic space contained in some n-dimensional Euclidean space over K. and we will let x denote the n-tuple of variables x1 through xn. Uh, since all our considerations in this talk are local, that is, they're at the level of germs, uh, we will assume that the origin is contained in this analytic space, and we will consider x0, uh, the germ of x at 0. So uh, the germ X0 is associated with a local ring that's isomorphic to a quotient of the ring of convergent power series over X uh, by an ideal I that's generated by a finite set of convergent power series F1 through Fs. And uh, geometrically in a small neighborhood of zero, uh, the space X is defined as the zero set of, of it's a set of common zeros of these power series F1 through Fs. And uh, consequently, we say that X0 is defined by the set of power series F1 through Fs. It's important for me to say at this point that uh, this uh, geometric uh, definition is not reversible in the sense that an analytic space is a locally ringed space that carries some additional algebraic information that is not uh, contained in this uh, uh, geometric description. Uh, now, uh, for most of this talk, uh, since we'll be talking about terms, we'll mostly be working with uh, these quotients of the ring of convergent power series that are associated to uh, germs at the origin, x0. And uh, if, this, uh, if the germ uh, that we are considering, x0, is defined by uh, a collection of algebraic power series, f1 through fs, that is power series that each satisfy a polynomial relationship, uh, we call it a Nash germ. Um, so the main problem uh, that uh, I'm interested in today is that if you have a germ X0 that is defined by convergent power series F1 through Fs, uh, we want to show that for each integer mu that is sufficiently large, there exists an approximation X hat of zero, uh, X hat at zero of X0 defined by mu degree approximations G1 through Gs of these power series F1 through Fs that uh, define uh, X0. And by mu degree approximations, I mean that uh, the mu jets of the GI are the same as the mu jets of the FI. And I want uh, this approximation to satisfy certain properties. Uh, the first is that uh, the GI are algebraic power series or polynomials. That is, uh, they are algebraic approximations through, uh, to the FI. And uh, the second is that uh, this approximating germ x hat zero is equisingular with respect to the Hilbert-Samuel function to x zero. 
And this just means that the Hilbert Samuel function of x0 and x hat 0 are the same. I'll have a little bit more to say about Hilbert Samuel functions in a bit. And uh, the third property uh, I want is that x hat 0 belongs to the same algebra geometric class as x0. And uh, by this, I mean uh, the, the class that's uh, so, some class that uh, we are interested in uh, that can be defined in, in terms of some algebra geometric property. Uh, the three results that I'm going to talk about today uh, correspond to three different choices for, the, for this class in point number three. Uh, the first is the class of complete intersection germs. That is, we want x hat zero to be a complete intersection germ if x zero is a complete intersection germ. The second is a class of cohen macaulay germs. And the third is a class of germs that are topologically equisingular to x zero. That is, they have the same topological type as x zero under some uh, homeomorphism germ at the origin. Uh, now, uh, the case that I will primarily focus on is, uh, the second case, the uh, case for cohen macaulay germs. And uh, the reason for this is that it uh, illustrates the proof technique that I used um, in, you know, in the best way possible. So uh, what we are essentially trying to do here is uh, we're trying to show that there exists arbitrarily close approximations to an analytic germ uh, that belong to some simpler class that is there, uh, you know, either Nash terms or they're defined by polynomials uh, that satisfy certain constraints. And the constraints are, you know, the Hilbert Samuel functions should be the same and uh, they should have uh, the same, you know, algebra geometric property that we choose. So, uh, now a little bit more about these Hilbert Samuel functions. Uh, so if we have, uh, if we let M be the maximal ideal in the ring of convergent power series uh, in variables X, uh, that is the ideal generated by the variables X1 through Xn. And if you have an ideal I, the Hilbert Samuel function of I evaluated at an integer eta is the dimension as a k vector space of the quotient of kx by i plus the eta at plus one power of the maximal ideal. And we're interested, uh, <clears throat> and yeah, for an analytic term x0 whose local ring is isomorphic to a quotient uh, kx by i, the Hilbert Samuel function of x0 is just the Hilbert Samuel function of i. Um, so we're interested in this Hilbert Samuel function, we use it to define uh, a notion of equisingularity that we use in, um, in our work because it is considered a measure of uh, singularity at a point and it plays uh, in this role, it plays a central role in uh, Hironaka's resolution of singularities where it tracks the progress of the desingularization. So, I mean, that, that, that's why uh, we're interested in this, uh, um, this particular function. So now I will briefly recall uh, some definitions from commutative algebra uh, on complete intersections and cohen macaulay rings. So if A with maximal ideal LM is an Eutherian local ring, then a sequence of elements A1 through AN in M is called a regular sequence when A1 is not a zero divisor in A and AI plus one is not a zero divisor in the quotient of A by A1 through AI for I is equal to one through L minus one. And an ideal in the ring A is called a complete intersection ideal when it's generated by some regular sequence A1 through AL. Now the depth of A is defined as the maximum length of a regular sequence in A and is denoted by depth A. And a ring is called Cohen Macaulay if the depth of A is the dimension of A. And an analytic germ is a complete intersection germ when its local ring is isomorphic to Kx by I for some complete intersection ideal I. And an analytic germ is Cohen Macaulay when this local ring is Cohen Macaulay. <clears throat> so, 
Dimension. What do you mean by the dimension of X? Uh, so this is the cruel dimension. Yeah. And in, in the case of complex analytic germs, it's equal to the, the local dimension of this analytic space at uh, the point zero. So uh, I'm going to first uh, talk about the result for uh, the case when we're considering complete intersections. Um, so it turns out that in this case, we have quite a strong uh, approximation result in the sense that any uh, mu degree approximation for, su for a sufficiently high degree uh, mu uh, satisfies uh, the conditions that we have, that is, it uh, satisfies those constraints that we've placed on the approximation. So <clears throat> if you let i be an ideal generated by uh, f1 through fk, uh, that is a complete intersection ideal with dimension kx by is equal to n minus k. Uh, then there exists an integer mu naught such that for every mu greater than mu naught and for any uh, g1 through gk uh, that are convergent power series which, which agree with the fi up to order mu, the ideal i mu generated by g1 through gk is a complete intersection ideal in kx, and it has the same Hilbert Samuel function as the ideal i. Uh, in particular, uh, this result implies that we can choose these gi to be sufficiently high degree polynomial truncations of the fi. Um, now, uh, the reason I presented this result is to contrast it with uh, the next case that we consider, the case of kern macaulay germs. And uh, this case of kern macaulay germs uh, represents uh, a natural uh, next step because uh, it is the next most general class after complete intersection germs in the sense that all complete intersection germs are kern macaulay germs. Yeah, may I, may I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah, uh, that this statement about the uh, uh, um, this function, cohen macaulay function here, uh, does it mean that the desingularization pro process of the analytic germs will be the same as the uh, algebraic germs here? Uh, no, that's not necessarily true. So, okay. uh, so, so this, um, uh, one of the motivations actually for, uh, for deriving a result like this is, is to ultimately uh, prove something that, that is exactly what you're saying. And I'll, I will mm -hmm. comment a little bit about that at the end. Okay, okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the, this, um, when we move to the class of cohen macaulay germs, uh, something interesting happens in that we don't have the sort of strong uh, result that we have in the complete intersection case. Uh, in this case, just any approximation doesn't work and some more care is needed in order to construct these approximations. Specifically, the result that we have is that if you have an ideal i generated by f1 through fs, uh, such that the quotient kx by i is going Macaulay with dimension n minus k, uh, then there exists an integer mu naught such that for every mu greater than mu naught, there are algebraic power series g1 through gs uh, that agree with the fi up to order mu, uh, such that the ideal generated by g1 through gs has the same hilbert Samuel function as the ideal i, and the quotient kx by i mu is going Macaulay with the same dimension as the quotient kx by i. Um, now, just uh, to contrast the two, uh, these are uh, uh, these, <clears throat> here we have uh, a result that is, uh, in, in some sense weaker than what we had in the previous case where uh, you know, any approximation would do. Here, we only know that there exist uh, algebraic power series approximations that satisfy these constraints. And um, uh, I, I will briefly present a, uh, a counter example to show that you know, uh, the, the previous type of result is actually not true for cohen macaulay terms um, towards the end though. Um, so now uh, the remainder of this talk is going to focus on the Cohen macaulay case and I'm going to try and walk you through uh, the exact techniques that I use to uh, 
prove this approximation result. So the main, uh, the main tool that I'm going to be using is a theorem called Artin's approximation theorem, uh, which I briefly recall here. So if you have uh, X uh, denoting the N tuple of variables X1 through Xn and Y denoting the M tuple of variables Y1 through Ym, uh, then Artin's approximation theorem states that if f of x, y is a vector of polynomials in y uh, with uh, algebraic power series coefficients in x, and uh, y bar is a vector of convergent power series such that it solves the equation uh, f of x, y equals zero when it's substituted for the variables y, then for any integer c, uh, there exists an M tuple of algebraic power series Y hat such that uh, they are also a solution of the system of equations and Y hat coincides with Y bar up to degree C. Um, so uh, now armed with this particular theorem, uh, the, the main idea behind uh, the proof of uh, this Cohen-Macaulay approximation result is to somehow encode uh, the cohen macaulay -ness and the hilbert samuel function of uh, this ideal i generated by uh, power series f1 through fs in some system of equations where f1 through fs are part of the solution vector and then to apply our approximation theorem to, to get these uh, approximations t1 through gs. Um, Essentially, uh, what this means is that uh, the constraints of our approximation, that is that it should preserve the hilbert samuel function uh, of this ideal i and the property of cohen macaulay -ness have to be somehow expressed in terms of some system of equations uh, to which Artin's approximation theorem is applicable. Now, in order to do that, uh, in order to describe uh, this translation of these constraints into equations, we'll need a couple of uh, uh, you know, mathematical objects that I will proceed to describe. Uh, the first one is a combinatorial object associated with an ideal I that's called Hironaka's diagram of initial exponents. And uh, the second is uh, the concept of standard basis of generators of an ideal I in the ring of convergent power series and the criteria for determining when some set of generators forms a standard basis. Uh, and uh, I'd like to point out here that standard basis uh, and this criteria are a direct generalization of Grubner basis in the polynomial case and Buchberger's criteria in the polynomial case. Um, so uh, in order to uh, describe this, diagram of initial exponents, uh, we need to first uh, establish some sort of total ordering on the set of n tuples of integers uh, that form the exponent vectors for monomials uh, in the ring of convergent power series. Uh, so if you let beta be the n tuple of integers beta one through beta n, um, first, uh, if you have a convergent power series that's expressed as the sum of sigma beta f beta x to the power of beta, then we, uh, we call the set of all the betas corresponding to non-zero terms in this power series expansion, uh, the support of the power series f. And now associated to each positive linear form, lambda of beta, that's just the sum from uh, of i is equal to one through n of lambda i beta i, where these lambda i are just positive real numbers, uh, is a total ordering on the set of n tuples of integers that's given by the lexicographic ordering of the n plus one tuples, where lambda of beta appears in the first place and beta n through beta one appear in the last n places. Now, uh, the initial exponent of the power series f with respect to lambda. And from now on, whenever I say with respect to lambda, I mean with respect to this uh, total ordering that is associated 
to uh, the positive linear form lambda. Um, so the initial exponent of a power series f with respect to lambda is defined as uh, the minimum uh, of uh, all the beta in the support of this power series f, where the minimum, once again, is taken with respect to this total ordering associated to lambda. Now, uh, for an ideal i in the ring of convergent power series, the diagram of initial exponents with respect to lambda is uh, defined as the set of all the initial exponents of non-zero elements of this ideal. <clears throat> so uh, ju just as a small note, uh, uh, when uh, lambda of beta is just the length of this n tuple of integers, which is the sum from one through n of beta i, uh, we, sub we usually suppress this subscript lambda and you know, we refer to the ordering corresponding to this particular choice of lambda as the standard ordering. So now uh, just to, to move on and give you a few pictures to demonstrate how these uh, diagrams of initial exponents behave, um, these, uh, this diagram here uh, in two variables gives you an example of what uh, one of these diagrams of initial exponents would look like, where uh, the points that are in this hatched area are all the points in the diagram. And we can see from this picture that uh, this particular diagram is defined by uh, two points, V1 and V2 where we can generate the diagram by just attaching a quadrant of integers to both v1 and v2 and taking the union of those two things. So this is a general fact about diagrams that any diagram of initial exponents uh, is defined in terms of some finite subset of the diagram called vertices. And in this case, uh, v1 and v2 are the vertices of this uh, diagram that we've drawn. Uh, now to consider a specific example, um, let's say we are once again working in two variables and we take the etaeth power of the maximal ideal. That is the etaeth power of the ideal generated by x1, uh, x2. Then uh, the diagram with respect to the standard ordering of this ideal is uh, shown in this picture. Uh, the uh, area that's hatched in green is all the points that lie inside the diagram. And we can see that the vertices of this diagram lie on a line that's given by beta one plus beta two is equal to eta. Uh, so this uh, suggests the next fact. And you know one of the main motivations for us uh, talking about these diagrams is that uh, the diagram of initial exponents of an ideal completely determines the Hilbert Samuel function. Uh, specifically, if you have some diagram uh, with respect to the standard ordering, then we can calculate uh, the Hilbert Samuel function of this ideal i by counting the number of points in this region that is hatched in red. That is the number of points in the complement of the diagram that lie below a certain line beta one plus beta two is equal to eta. And this is, this is in the case of two variables, but this um, result generalizes to the general case, uh, which, which just says that you can count the number of points in the complement of the diagram uh, that have length less than or equal to eta, and you get the Hilbert Samuel function of the ideal I evaluated at eta. Um, <clears throat> the other reason uh, these diagrams of initial exponents are important to us is that we can actually uh, use the, the shape of the diagram to tell whether uh, this quotient ring kx by is Cohen Macaulay. Uh, specifically, the result uh, that we'll be using is that up to a generic linear change of coordinates, the following two statements are equivalent. Uh, the first is that the quotient kx by i is Cohen Macaulay and has dimension n minus k. And the second is that there exists some positive linear form lambda such that the diagram of i with respect to this lambda 
is d times n to the n minus k that it has it has a specific shape this sort of cylindrical shape now this uh, result follows from something called hironaka's flatness criteria that uses uh, diagrams of initial exponents to uh, to classify flatness of maps and uh, the fact uh, so uh, this result follows from uh, hironaka's flatness criteria and also the fact that a germ x0 is con macaulay if and only if the finite and proper projection onto uh, this Euclidean space of dimension n minus k by normalization is flat. Uh, so if we combine this fact with Hironaka's flatness criteria, it's not too difficult to derive this. Um, so just to give you a picture of you know, what I mean by this shape d times uh, n to the n minus k, uh, this is now an example of the frontier of a diagram in three variables, where you can see that uh, because all the vertices of the diagram v1, v2, v3 lie in uh, beta1, beta2, this diagram has that shape where you know d is equal to uh, all the points that are in this plane that lie inside the diagram. And um, n minus k is equal to one here. So it's just d times n. Contrast this to the general case, where in three variables, you may have uh, a diagram that has vertices that are elevated of this beta one, beta two plane. In this case, this vertex V2 does not lie in it. So uh, this diagram does not have that, that shape, uh, that sort of cylindrical shape associated with cohen macauliness <clears throat> So now, uh, we know that uh, both the constraints that we're interested in, cohen macauliness and the hilbert samuel function, are uh, somehow uh, related to these diagrams of initial exponents. The next task that we have is actually translating this relationship into some you know, system of equations. So in order to do that, uh, we'll need to uh, talk about something called standard basis. And for an ideal I in the ring of convergent power series generated by FN through FS, this set of generators forms a standard basis with respect to lambda when the set of initial exponents with respect to lambda of the FI contain all the vertices of this diagram uh, of I with respect to lambda. <clears throat> now, uh, with this, definition uh, it is immediate that you know if you if you have a standard basis of an ideal uh, you automatically have the diagram of initial exponents uh, because you, you can just take the uh, exponents of uh, the initial exponents of all the elements of your standard basis and you'll get the vertices and these vertices will give you the diagram now it's a natural question whenever you have something like this and and oh by the way uh I'd like to mention here again that this is a direct analog of the definition of grubner basis uh in the case of polynomial rings so <clears throat> it's a natural question that when you have uh, a definition like this whether there is some criteria uh, for determining whether some set of generators of an ideal form a standard basis if you don't know the diagram of initial exponents. And uh, it turns out that this is true. Uh, and in order to, to describe this criteria and to present it, we'll need a couple of uh, auxiliary definitions. The first is this notion of a standard representation. So if you have power series F1 through Fs and G, uh, and uh, we say that G has a standard representation in terms of F1 through Fs with respect to lambda, and there exists some power series Q1 through Qs such that G is the sum uh, from uh, for I is equal to one through S of Qi Fi. And the initial exponent of G with respect to lambda is less than or equal to the initial exponent to the minimum, less than or equal to the minimum of the initial exponents of these products Qi Fi. And here, in order to take care of the zero case, uh, we assume that uh, 
the initial exponent of any non-zero g is always less than the initial exponent of zero. So what this uh, condition tells us, uh, this condition on the initial exponent tells us is essentially that there is no cancellation that occurs in this uh, combination on the right-hand side uh, in terms of the initial uh, terms. So that is, you know, the initial terms of these uh, products QIFI do not cancel out. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a consequence that if, uh, it's a consequence of Hironaka's division, which is just the generalization of polynomial division to the power series case, uh, that if these power series F1 through Fs are a standard basis of the ideal that they generate, then every element G inside the ideal has a standard representation in terms of F1 through Fs. Uh, so the other uh, piece that we'll need in order to uh, present uh, this criteria for determining standard basis is the notion of an S series. So if you have two power series uh, that have initial terms f x to the alpha and g x to the beta with respect to some lambda, and if you let L be the least common multiple of f x to the alpha and g x to the beta, uh, and uh, define uh, the S series of f and g as L by f of x to the alpha f minus L by g x to the beta g, um, and this is uh, all with respect to some ordering determined by lambda, then we can, uh, uh, then we have something called Becker's S series criteria. And this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, was proved by Becker in a paper in 1990. Uh, so, it states that if S is a finite subset of the ring of convergent power series, then S is a standard basis relative to uh, some lambda of the ideal that it generates, if and only if, for every pair of power series in S, the S series S G1, G2 has a standard representation in terms of the other elements of S. Um, and just to, go back a little bit, uh, what we're doing in defining this S series is we're just multiplying F and G by some terms that are intended to naively cancel out the initial terms of these two products here. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Grubner basis and the case for polynomial rings, uh, this uh, S series criteria is a direct analog of Buchberger's criteria, and these S series are direct analogs of S pairs. Uh, so now, with this criteria, we can finally uh, accomplish what we set out to do, which is you know encode these constraints of our approximation in terms of some system of equations. So once again, uh, we know that uh, we're considering, you know, the case where we have kx by i, which is a Cohen-Macaulay ring. So by our relationship between Cohen-Macaulay-ness and diagrams of initial exponents, we know that there exists some lambda such that the diagram has this shape d times n to the n minus k. And uh, let us assume for now, just for simplicity, that these F1 through Fs uh, that are the given generators of the ideal I are already a standard basis. Um, then, you know, uh, by the definition of uh, S series, you know, we can write S series in terms of some monomials. Uh, we can write the S series of the pair Fi, Fj in terms of some monomials Pij and Pji. And uh, by uh, Becker's S series criteria, we know that there exists QMIJ convergent power series such that uh, 
this expression on the left hand side that comes from the S series of Fi and Fj is equal to the sum from m equals one through s of qm ij fm. And uh, we have one such relationship for each uh, pair ij uh, where i and j are from one through s. And obviously since uh, this uh, expression on the right hand side is a standard representation, uh, we have the condition that the initial exponent of the left hand side uh, with respect to lambda is less than the minimum of the initial exponents of these products on the right hand side. <clears throat> so now the trick uh, is to treat uh, th these symbols fi and qmij in this set of equations as variables. Uh, so if you do that, then you know by construction we already have convergent power series solutions that we can substitute for the fi and the qmij that solve this system of equations, and hence we can apply Artin's approximation theorem uh, with order mu to obtain approximations uh, gi to the fi and qmij hat to the qmij that are algebraic power series, and uh, which and such that you know the GI and the FI have the same terms up to order mu. Uh, now, uh, in order to enforce this um, relationship between the exponents for these approximations, GI and the QMIJ, we can choose this mu large enough so that it captures the initial exponents on both sides of these equations. Uh, which will automatically ensure that you know this condition is satisfied, and that in turn, once again from uh, Becker's S series criteria, will ensure that these G1 through GS are a standard basis, and if they're a standard basis uh, for the ideal that they generate I mu, um, and since they agree up to you know order mu with the F1 through FS, it means that they have the same initial exponents. They have the same initial exponents. The diagram of I mu with respect to lambda has the same vertices, and hence it has the same shape as the diagram uh, of I with respect to lambda. And by the uh, relationship between Cohen Macauliness and uh, the shape of the diagram, uh, that tells us that you know, Kx by I mu is Cohen Macaulay with dimension n minus k. Now, uh, in order to convert this uh, sketch into a full proof, we need to address uh, two things. The first is the case where uh, the initial set of generators of an ideal of the ideal that we have F1 through Fs do not form a standard basis. So in this case, uh, the fix is pretty simple. We can just add some elements uh, f s plus one through f r in the ideal, such that the expanded set f one through f r does form a standard basis. And because these element, these new elements that we've added uh, belong to this ideal, we know that uh, they can be expressed in terms of f one through f s. Uh, by relationships of this form where these R, I, K are just convergent power series. So what we can do is we can take uh, these uh, relationships and treat them as equations in variables uh, F and these new variables R, I, K and just add them uh, to the system of equations star and then once again proceed as before in order to uh, get approximations to now, you know, whatever initial set of generators that we have that uh, preserve Cohen Macauliness. The second point that has to be addressed is uh, the other constraint that we have, that is uh, the Hilbert Samuel function. Now, uh, we have a small problem here because the Hilbert Samuel function is determined by the diagram of I with respect to the standard ordering. Uh, but what we have up to now is an approximation that preserves the shape of the diagram with respect to the special ordering that is related to Cohen Macauliness. Uh, but uh, this too can be fixed 
uh, fairly simply. Uh, so to enforce the preservation of both the diagram with respect to the standard ordering and the diagram with respect to the special ordering lambda, uh, we can once again expand the set of uh, the initial set of generators, just as we did uh, in this previous point, to include standard basis elements with respect to both the standard ordering as well as this ordering lambda. And uh, subsequently, we will get two system of equations coming from these S series and the S series criteria uh, that are uh, similar in form to the system uh, star. So we'll get one system for you know, the S series corresponding to the ordering um, associated with lambda and another corresponding to the standard ordering. And subsequently, we just apply Artin's approximation theorem in the same way to this to this larger system uh, to get an approximation that satisfies all the constraints that we have. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there are a couple of things that I want to go through quickly. The first is it's a natural question to ask uh, that you know if you have a standard basis, can you just simply take polynomial truncations of it and get something that's a standard basis? So this is not true in general. So if you have uh, this particular ideal in two variables that's generated by these power series F1 and F2 uh, that are given uh, as follows, then we note first that F1, F2 are a standard basis of I because this uh, S series corresponding to F1, F2 is zero. Uh, and this is with respect to the standard ordering. Um, now, if we take uh, the initial exponent of the S series of uh, the mu order truncations of F1 and F2 for mu greater than five, uh, then this gives us one comma mu plus one, which if you can, if you see the initial exponents here, one comma mu plus one does not uh, lie in the diagram that's uh, determined by the vertices corresponding to these two initial exponents. And uh, hence, it means that, you know, uh, if a standard basis for these uh, uh, mu order truncations would include some more elements that are not just simply contained in the truncations of, you know, our original standard basis. Um, so, I mean, this tells us that, you know, it's really necessary for us to, uh, to take into account uh, this S series criteria when we are trying to approximate a standard basis. The second is uh, briefly thing, uh, second counter example that I'll briefly touch upon is uh, to show you that in the Cohen macaulay case, you don't have a strong result like the one that you had in the case for complete intersections. So once again, uh, if you take an ideal I uh, generated by three power series in the ring of convergent power series over three variables, X, Y, and Z, uh, where F1, F2, and F3, the generators of I are uh, given here. And if we describe some ideal I mu generated by power series G1, G2, G3, where G1 and G3 are the same as F1 and F3. And uh, G2 has been changed at order mu onwards by adding some, uh, some perturbation uh, uh, of order mu. So, the first thing to note that you can quickly verify is that these uh, generators F1, F2, F3 form a standard basis of this ideal. And uh, because the initial exponents of these uh, power series all lie in you know, the xy plane, uh, this kxyz by i is Cohen Macaulay. The next thing to note is that if you take the S series of G2, G3, where uh, once again, these Gs are the generators of this approximation I mu, you get X square, Y square, Z to the power of mu minus two H of C. 
and uh, this essentially tells you that this quotient kxyz by mu is not Cohen Macaulay because if it was Cohen Macaulay, uh, it would be free as a kz module. And if it was free as a kz module, uh, and I mean, this, the, the existence of uh, this element uh, in the ideal I mu uh, contradicts the fact that it's free as a kz module because you have some expression that is purely in uh, Z that will cancel out something that is non-zero in this quotient. So, uh, I mean, that will annihilate something that's non-zero in the quotient. So that's a contradiction. Now, uh, very briefly, uh, the last result that I'll touch upon before I just make some concluding remarks about uh, this notion of equi resolution that I mentioned in the abstract is uh, approximation with topological equisingularity. That's approximations that preserve the topological type of the initial germ. So if you have power series F1 through Fs in the ring of convergent power series, and we let X0 be an analytic germ that's defined by F1 through Fs, then there exists an integer mu such that for all mu greater than mu naught, there are algebraic power series G1 through Gs and a homeomorphism germ H uh, <clears throat> around zero of the ambient space to itself, uh, such that uh, one, these algebraic power series Gk have the same terms up to order mu as the Fk. Uh, the Nash germ X0 hat, defined by the G1 through GS uh, has the same hilbert Samuel function as the germ X at zero. And uh, this approximation X hat at zero is the image of X zero in this homeomorphism germ. So uh, this is an improvement over a result uh, that was proved by T. Mostovsky in 1984. Uh, and uh, Mostovsky's original result uh, contains points one and three. Uh, the part that we've added is this uh, preservation of the hilbert Samuel function. So the method used to prove, the method that we use to prove this result is, uh, uh, you know, based on pretty much the same, uh, uh, general concept as the Cohen Macaulay case, that is, you know, to encode uh, the constraints that we have in some systems of equations and then apply Artin's approximation theorem. So uh, by a result due to Varchenko, uh, Zariski equisingularity implies topological equisingularity. And Zariski equisingularity is something that is uh, defined algebraically, so it can be encoded in some system of equations. And uh, subsequently, we just use the approach that we used in the Cohen Macaulay case and add to the system of equations some additional equations that come from the S series criteria, which enforce the preservation of the Hilbert Samuel function. And uh, we combine it specifically with uh, a new approach that was used to prove Mostovsky's. Uh, result in a recent paper by Bilsky, Parshinsky, and Rohn in uh, 2017 uh, that, that uses a slightly more advanced version of Artin's approximation theorem than the one that I presented in this talk, which is called the nested artin Puoski approximation theorem. And uh, the reason this more advanced approximation theorem is required is that uh, the equations that come from Zariski equisingularity have certain dependencies that need to be uh, taken into account. So uh, finally, uh, moving on to some future work, uh, the first immediate application of these results is that you can obtain an approximation result for germs of flat maps from Cohen Macaulay germs that preserve the Hilbert Samuel function of the special fiber. And this is an almost you know, a fairly direct application of the Cohen Macaulay result. So this has already been done. It's uh, available as a preprint on archive and uh, it's currently under review for publication. 
the second open question is whether uh, you know this work can be generalized to arbitrary fields k uh, it turns out that that it is uh, it can be done because if you carefully go through most of the results uh, the only assumption that they depend on in terms of the field k is that it's infinite and this comes from you know the generic linear changes of coordinates that appear in you know the normalization and uh, obviously uh, as we did in the Cohen Macaulay case, uh, we are essentially appro finding approximations that preserve the diagram of initial exponents with respect to two orders. We can extend this to n orders. And it's an open question as to whether this extension to multiple orders uh, can be used to uh, get some sort of finer grained approximation result, as in you know, encoding some finer properties than just complete intersection or Cohen Macaulay-ness. Finally, uh, the perhaps the most ambitious uh, future work uh, based on the results that are presented today is to extend this topological equisingularity result to the entire local resolution of singularities of a germ to obtain topologically equiresolvable approximations. And uh, I have a diagram uh, to explain what I mean by that. So if you assume that X and X hat are germs, uh, we've suppressed you know, the subscripts here just to make the presentation a little bit simpler. And uh, by Hironaka's theorem, X has a local resolution of singularities where these sigma i are some blow ups with uh, non-singular centers. Then uh, our topological ecosingularity result tells us that we have this homeomorphism germ H0 of the ambient space in which X is embedded uh, between X and some algebraic approximation of X. Now this algebraic approximation itself has a resolution of singularities and uh, by topological equiresolution, what I mean is that we want to show the existence of these homeomorphism germs H1 through HP uh, that uh, give us topological equisingularity between each of these intermediates. And uh, the preservation of the Hilbert Samuel functions uh, under each of these approximations also implies that you know, the lengths of these resolutions are the same and you know, both the final products will be uh, non-singular. So that's it for me for today. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk and uh, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aftab. Um, are there any questions? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, just a question uh, about this algebraic power series that you get. Uh, do you have any idea of the degree of algebraicity of, that might be involved? So, I'm, I'm sorry, so the, you, by degree of algebraicity, can you just uh, describe what you mean? Like, do you mean the degree of the, uh, like the polynomial relation that each one of them satisfies? Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, there's, uh, I don't think that uh, there's a way that, uh, you can get that from this approximation result. Uh, at least like the, this result does not depend on that degree in any way. And it, it uh, I mean, I don't see how you would uh, derive that from it. Yes, you cannot get it because of the Artin approximation, I guess that you, you don't have access to the- Yes, yeah, uh, like, 
they don't have access to some explicit like there's as far as i know there's no constructive way to construct these approximations i mean it is uh, uh, that is actually another uh, like open area that i'm actively working on is to you know kind of replace this artens approximation theorem by some constructive procedure by which you know these uh, these algebraic approximations can be obtained but uh, that uh, this i mean there are some roadblocks to that thank you other question if i may yes uh, what, what's the difference between r and c in your work so in my work there's no difference so the these the results and and the proofs whatever i have they work exactly the same for r and c uh but uh, the um, I mean, the only comment I would make is that in the case of C, uh, there is a much tighter link uh, between, you know, the, the geometry of this analytic space and the algebraic properties, and that becomes a little bit more uh, tenuous in the case of R. So, uh, uh, I mean, the fact that. Uh, most of the results in this talk, uh, they 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 are very careful not to attach, you know, the initial generators of these these ideals that we have in these quotients, uh, which which I would say, you know, is potentially more important in the case of R uh, than C. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, you, and you mentioned also other fields at the end of your talk. Yes. Uh, for example, the, the, PA, the fields of PADIC numbers could work or things like that? Yes. Uh, as I said, the, the, only, uh, the only real restriction on the field K is the restriction that you get from Noether normalization, which is that it should be infinite. Okay. To accommodate these uh, these generic linear changes of coordinates. So yes, uh, these fields of periodic numbers, uh, you know, the, the rational numbers, any infinite field should work. In fact, uh, oh, okay, okay, every number of fields would work. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you still are uh, in characteristic zero, I guess. Oh no no no! There is no, okay. there is ah. no assumption uh, on the characteristic because ah, okay okay. Because if, if you see all the results that we have uh, here, which, you know, the definition of a standard basis and uh, Artin's approximation theorem, they don't depend on the field. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, that's true. theorem is true for a very large class of fields. Mm -hmm. and, right. Uh, right. The, uh, then you have no other normalization, which, you know, is also true in, uh, in these, these fields of characteristic, uh, finite characteristic as well. So, uh, so yeah, everything extends. I mean, there's no assumption on the characteristic. The only real assumption is that the field should be infinite. That I mean. Okay. That's... Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, may I ask uh, something? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's concerning the yeah the the problem of uh, topologically accurate solvable approximations. Yes, I yes. guess. Uh, well, uh, there are the characteristic for the moment. In, maybe it has to be zero in order to have uh, reduction of singularities. But yeah, well, in any case, no, this it was not that problem. Uh, the question it's uh, do do you know of uh, any um, yeah. I guess if uh, if x is of dimension one, uh, this is true because of uh, I mean uh, uh, a key reduction of singular of singularities of of course it's the same as topological uh, equivalence somehow. But uh, do, do you know if uh, yeah if, if there is uh, th this problem is is solved in in other cases? I mean in for surfaces of certain types of surfaces or, or um, is... no off the top of my head i i uh, i don't know of uh, 
uh, you know, specific results with uh, which have assumptions on the dimension uh, of x or yeah. you know uh, it, number of equations that define it. Yeah. But um, uh, so it's, it's yeah, just no, to know if uh, what is the state of art of this problem. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I don't know about results for specific n. Uh, okay. But uh, I mean, uh, honestly, my, uh, my thinking has mostly been focused on the general case. Uh, so like in terms of, uh, in terms of this uh, particular problem, uh, the, um, I mean, the strongest result that, you know, could potentially lead to, you know, something like this is a recent result by Parashinsky and Paunescu, which states that this um, homeomorphism germ that I talked about uh, in the topological equisingularity result, it's actually um, arc analytic and sub analytic. So, uh -huh. so then the question is like, maybe is it possible to define some uh, define this h1 in the first step as some sort of lifting of h0 yeah uh, and then you know subsequently keep doing that uh, to get uh, the whole result but but yeah I, I like that's something i'm still working on so yeah oh, okay okay <laughs> thank you thank you very much okay well thank you very much and uh, i think we have to uh stop here because we have uh, another question session coming up okay so Aftab, thanks again for your talk Very thank nice you talk. And, uh, hopefully we'll see you around <laughs> okay thank you sure bye-bye thank you bye <laughs>